Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my week two 2019 NFL predictions. Well, as the season kicked off, it was an amazing week uh, for everybody out there. Uh, what a great week of football there was. There were tons of surprises, pretty consistent beatings, and Definitely a lot of teams improved or deproved, definitely on how all the games went. Um, for me personally, it was a good week uh, so far. I know I'm doing this video on a Monday, uh, but I wanted to get my picks out early for everybody, um, just so uh, they, they could have them and my thoughts. So, again, so my record so far this week, and I would put the last two games from tonight uh, into, or from, yeah, from tonight, into my, into my description. Uh, tomorrow or sometime after they are done. So right now against the spread this week so far, I am seven six and one against the spread, and straight up I am nine four and one. Um, it's weird having two ties in both the against the spread, or well, let me put it this way: it's not weird having ties and against the spread because you always can get the number right on the button. It's weird having a tie in both against the spread and straight up um, for two different games. I got the against the spread tie because of the um, Rams Panthers game. The Rams were three point favorites, and they ended up. Uh, winning by three and then the uh, the tie for the straight up game was the uh, utter collapse of the uh, The uh, Detroit Lions having an 18 point lead being up 24 to 6 and then they traded field goals uh, In overtime and it, there was not a winner. I personally don't like that I am somebody that anytime there is a tie in football I've always wanted the college rules to apply that basically somebody, until somebody doesn't score, you can go field goal, field goal, touchdown, touchdown. Until somebody doesn't score on the drive, you keep going. I, I know I would say that there could be a lot of fatigue with that, a lot of injuries, or you know possibly that. But I think that's what you should do. But unlike college, you shouldn't put it at the 25-yard line. I've always hated that with college football, uh, putting a 25-yard line. But, you know, kudos to Kyler Murray. Going uh, 29 of 51, 304 yards, two, Ds, two TDs and a pick. Um, that definitely was very uh, um, very Tebow-esque because through the first three quarters, he was like 9 of 20, like their first 10 drives of 58. He had a combined 58 yards, and it just really wasn't looking good. He was also sacked four times through that three quarters. But hey, for the Cardinals, that's a big one with the tie. For the Lions, shout out to Half Moon's picks. Sorry, buddy. The Lions continue to show why they're the Lions. Um... Yeah, so against yeah, so so against the spread I am seven, six, and one, and straight up I am nine, four, and one. That accounts that equals up to a fifty-four percent winning percentage against the spread and a straight up percentage of sixty-eight that's sixty-eight percent um straight up. Uh, in that, uh, I guess in technical technically it's point five three eight and point six seven eight through the first thirteen games of the year. Um I am so now with all those uh uh, previous week numbers out of the way. Let me give you my picks for week two of the 2019 NFL season. All right, so this Thursday when we kick off week two, uh, the 0-1 Tampa Buccaneers are going to the Carolina Panthers. The Carolina Panthers are six and a half point favorites in this game. I like Carolina here minus six and a half, and Carolina straight up. And then on Sunday when the 1-0 San Francisco 49ers go to the 0-1 Cincinnati Bengals. Um, this game is a pick 'em right now on the line. I am going to take the San Francisco 49ers against the spread in that case, and uh, San Francisco straight up. Then the next game, when the 1 0 Los Angeles Chargers go to the 0 0 1 Detroit Lions, the Los Angeles Chargers are three point faves in this game. I like the LA Chargers here, minus three, and the LA Chargers straight up. Then the next game, when the 1 0 Minnesota Vikings go to the 1 0 Green Bay Packers, in Lambeau Field. The Green Bay Packers are two and a half point favorites in this game. I like Green Bay here, minus two and a half, and Green Bay straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-1 Indianapolis Colts go to the 1-0 Tennessee Titans. Uh, this game, the Tennessee Titans are three point favorites in this game, but I'm going to take the Colts here, plus three, um, and the Titans straight up. I'm hedging my bets, but I really feel this is an even game. <laughs> and it was kind of like the Bills Jets last week where I wouldn't be surprised if Indy won this game at all. Like I think the Titans are the better team on paper, especially after what you saw in week one. 
But I'm going to take the Colts just because, you know, the fun fact, I, I know Jacoby Brissett lost the last time, but they've lost, like, 11 of the last 12 meetings, you know, that the Colts have played the Titans. So, and how the Colts looked, I'll take the Colts on the underdog, on on the on the money line. I'll take Indy plus three, but I'll take Tennessee straight up. Again, it very, very much Bills Jets to me, where, like, either team could win, so I'm going to hedge my bet and get a win somehow. But, yeah, so... You guys can get me. Uh, you guys can get me, but I just don't feel that it's that even of a game. Uh, the next game, when the one and zero New England Patriots go to the zero and one Miami Dolphins, this looks like a college spread instead of an NFL spread. The New England Patriots are seventeen point favorites in this game, but after how bad the Miami Dolphins looked, I have to take the New England Patriots minus seventeen. I know it's crazy because like the last, the two biggest spreads uh, were definitely Washington and. Uh, Trying to think of Washington was one of the biggest spreads in Seattle. Washington and Seattle were the two biggest spreads. They were about 10 points, and they were both able to cover. Um, and definitely Baltimore blew the brakes off Miami, even though they were only a 7-point favorite. And 17 is a massive number. But um, I just think, you know, after how long it looked, you have to take New England against the spread. Uh, the next game, when the 1-0 Buffalo Bills go to the 0-1 New York Giants in, the, in one of the battles of New York, or, uh, or in the battle of upstate New York versus the city, uh, the Bills are two-point favorites in this game. I like Buffalo here, minus two, and Buffalo straight up. Then the next game, when the 1-0 Seattle Seahawks go to the 0-1 Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers are three-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. Uh, I'm going to go for the upset here. I'm going to take Seattle here, plus three-and-a-half, and Seattle straight up. And then the next game, when the 1-0 Dallas Cowboys go to the 0-1 Washington Redskins. The Dallas Cowboys are four-point favorites in this game. I like Dallas here, minus four. And Dallas straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-0-1 Arizona Cardinals go to the 1-0 Baltimore Ravens. The Baltimore Ravens are 13-point favorites in this game. I like Baltimore here straight up, but I'm going to take Arizona plus 13 uh, against the spread. And then the next game, when the 0-1-1 Jacksonville Jaguars go to the 1-0, 0-1-1 or 0-0-1 Houston Texans. The Houston Texans are 8.5-point favorites in this game. I'm going to take Jacksonville here, Jacksonville here plus 8.5, but I'm going to take Houston straight up. It's very much to me like last week with the Eagles and Redskins, very much that kind of same way with how Jacksonville played. I think Gardner Minshew will surprise people against Houston's defense, but we'll see. Uh, then there's that game. Then the next game when the 1-0 Kansas City Chiefs go to the Oakland Raiders, it'll be 1-0, 0-1, or 0-0-1. Uh, the Chiefs are 9-point favorites in this game. I like Kansas City here minus 9, and Kansas City straight up. Then the next game, when the 0-1 Chicago Bears go to the Denver Broncos, it be 1-0, 0-1, or 0-0-1. This game is a pick em right now. Uh, I am going to take Chicago against the spread, and Chicago straight up, but I am not very confident in that, especially after watching Thursday night. But I'll explain that in a second. Then the next game, the game of the week, the rematch of the NFC Championship game from last year, the New Orleans Saints are going to the 1-0 Los Angeles Rams. Um, to me, again... I had to do what I did with Indian Tennessee and the Bills and the Jets. I'm going to hedge my bet here. I'm going to take the Rams straight up. I'm going to take the Saints plus three. I think the Rams are a little bit better of a team, but I wouldn't be surprised. And I think this game could be one of those two-point or one-point, you know, winning field goal type games of how good these teams are. Or also it could be just off a field goal. So, you know, I think it's going to be that close of a game. It's definitely the game of the week. A lot of intrigue. A lot of uh, firepower here. This could be another huge playoff matchup, and that will be interesting to see. Uh, then the Sunday night game with the 1-0 Philadelphia Eagles go to the 0-1 Atlanta Falcons. This is the weirdest one for me. I do not understand how, when I went on um, the website I go to, oddsharks.com slash NFL, this is where I get all my uh, against the spread lines. This game is a pick em right now, which stuns me after what I saw Atlanta go through um, on yesterday. But I'm going to take, with it being that easy, I'm going to take Philadelphia against the spread in a pick em in Philadelphia Straight up. And then finally, the Monday night game. The rematch from the very first Monday night football game on September 1st or 8th, 1970, when the 0-1 Cleveland Browns go to the 0-1 New York Jets. I know the Browns are home, so it's, it's the opposite. The Browns are 2.5-point favorites in this game. I like Cleveland here, minus 2.5, and, and Cleveland straight up. All right, so time for my thoughts on each game. Uh, Car the Carolina Panthers over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, I am taking the Carolina Panthers here. Because what I saw out of uh, Carolina, I was uh, mildly, you know, I was impressed 
with how they did. Um, Cam Newton, he threw for 238 yards, no TDs and a pick. Um, it what you know, like he he did okay. I, it, I was really impressed with Christian McCaffrey. He had about 67 percent of the Panthers' offense. But the one thing I was most impressed with was how the Panthers' defense got turnovers on the Los Angeles Rams. Let me uh, pull this up here real, real quick. Um, I think, let me see here. Um, let's see, the Panthers and Rams. Um, yeah, so, I'm sorry, he had two, Cam Newton had 239 yards passing. Um, the, the Panthers were able to force, uh, I'm sorry, um, the, they were they were to get one turnover, which was massive, but I, I was just really impressed with how Carolina was able to keep fight in that game. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I was just really impressed with how they were able to keep fight in that game. I uh, thought that Greg Olson looked decent for, you know, making some big plays there. Greg Olson, you know, did his job well. And then I look at the Bucks, and here's the thing. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers somewhat played a competitive game against the Niners. And it was close, pretty much back and forth. Uh, Quan, uh, Quan Alexander... Former Tampa Bay Buccaneer took a nasty cheap shot to James Winston. I hope he's okay. Um, but I thought that was a dirty play, and I was happy Quan got ejected. Um, but looking at that game, there were just some weird decision-making. And it all basically came down to Jameis, who threw three interceptions, and he had two pick sixes. One to Richard Sherman, who did not have a pick all of last year, and one to Witherspoon. I can't say his first name. I would butcher it horribly. Which was his first career pick six, and they lost by 14 points. Jameis Winston threw the game away. And both pick, both interceptions are horrible. And by the way, he has the most multiple interception games since he's come to the league in 2015, surpassing Blake Bortles. And just looking at how the Bucks play, looking at some of the decision making, there was this weird moment in the game where it was a fourth and seven, and they were going for a kick, but there was an offside or it was encroachment, and they got to a fourth and two. They were down by six. There was a 13 minutes left in the fourth quarter, and J and Bruce Arians decides to go for it instead of taking the field goal. To make it a three-point game, and then he ends up taking, kicking another field goal at that same position, which they could have tied the game. Instead, he gives it to Jameis, who throws a horrible pass to Jaquiski Tart, which could have got picked. But just after that, so that, that's why I'm taking the Panthers. Like I, I just looked at the Bucks and said the Bucks may have talent. They showed, you know, Ronald Jones had a solid game. You know, uh, I thought you know Chris Goblin made some good plays. OJ Howard, like that offense can move the ball pretty effectively, but. Just when you look at that Panthers defense, they'll be able to get to uh, Jameis Winston. They'll get him pressured. They'll they'll make him. They'll cause a few more turnovers, and that'll be the difference in the game. I also think that uh, Christian McCaffrey will have a very solid game in terms of the ground and the air. And also, the Panthers have seemed to you know Cam looks healthy, and I just feel like again Cam's played a much more efficient game. And I saw what the Panthers did. They looked more impressive in defeat than the Bucks did. And I feel like again that's going to be the difference. And Jameis turning the ball over. Will once again, be the difference in this game because I feel like the Bucks have better like skill positions besides maybe running back, but Jameis is going to make more mistakes, and I just see the Bucks defense not being able to hold up or Jameis costing them the difference in the game. So that's why I like Carolina here minus six and a half and Carolina straight up. The next game, the Niners over the Bengals. Um, this one, I am taking the San Francisco 49ers. In the sense of like I did with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It's one of those things where I watched that Bengals game. And I have to give Zach Taylor a lot of credit. Zach Taylor knows how to... Zach Taylor knows how to coach. He knows how to coach offense. Do you know right now, today, you know... Uh, you know, regarding uh, if Drew Brees, Deshaun Watson, Joe Flacco, and Derek Carr do not go over 411 yards... Do you know that Andy Dalton is uh, through for a career high and is now leading the league in passing yards through one week? Andy Dalton. John Ross had 160 yards. I, did, I think last year he had about 138 all total last year. This was about A.J. Green. And I was genuinely impressed with how well the Bengals team played. Um, they, they were right there with the Seahawks. They got a lot of good sacks on an offensive line. Um, that was very shaky. Justin Britt was dealing with an injury and all that. But the Bengals came to play, and they were really effective. T 
Tyler Eifert looked like the best he's at. He's been the last few years. He's healthy, but he looked the best there. And I was just really impressed with the Bengals. But kind of like what happened with Seattle, it's one of those things where this game is going to be competitive, and I see where this could be a pick But just looking at that Niner defense, I think they'll be able to get pressure on Andy Dalton. You have Nick Bosa. You have D. Ford. Um, you have uh, Buckner. You have a very loaded uh, defensive line. I think the secondary did a great job. Um, I don't know if Andy Dalton's going to make interceptions like that or that, that bad of a throw for turnovers. But it's just one of those things where the Niners, like, they got their win. And I trust, like, the Niners' defense as a whole, like, as a whole collective unit, uh, much more effectively than I do the Bengals. I think the Bengals are going to be competitive. Um, I'm not going to pass it by Cincinnati to make this competitor even steal the game with how well they played. Uh, but it just, again, kind of like with the uh, kind of such as with the Seahawks, very much so the Niners to me the same way. Not as much better, but just a little bit better. And I'm going to trust Jimmy's upside with the talent they have versus Cincinnati and their young core of Andy Dalton, Tyler Boyd, John Ross, a bunch of young guys and unproven guys. Also, it was really impressive because the Bengals have had one of the worst, had one of the worst offensive lines going out there yesterday, and they looked fantastic offensively or just looked much more dynamic and more fresh than I'd ever seen with Marvin Lewis in any of that time. So that's why I like San Francisco here in a pick em against the spread and San Francisco straight up. Then the next game, the Los Angeles Chargers over the Detroit Lions. Um, this game to me, it's very much in the sense of I just trust the Chargers to win. Uh, I want to congratulate Austin Eckler for having for being the first Charger to have 150 scrimmage yards and three TDs in an opening game. I thought he was absolutely fantastic. He got the game-winning rushing touchdown uh, to um, to win the game. And I also want to congratulate for uh, the Chargers, their kicker. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, their kicker, who I thought was great. He was replacing Michael Badgley. He's their punter as well. Let me see. Um, the guy's name, I'll find it here. Um, Tr- Travis Long. That was the guy that I thought had a fantastic game. And he's kicking. And that kicking basically was the difference in the game. Because Adam Vinatieri missed uh, two field goals and an extra point. And that was the difference in the game. So congratulations to Travis Long for being the hidden MVP of the game. Job well done by him. Um, but now they're 5-0 and in their last five games without Melvin Gordon. Um, the offense looked effective. Phillip Rivers threw for about 300 plus yards. A few TDs and an interception. Though that was one of... That was the defensive play of the week, um, if anybody sees it, uh, what Malik Hooker did in the end zone. Um, but, yeah, I, I was just really imp- impressed solidly by the Chargers. That offensive line, though, will have a little bit of a hard work. You know, they're, they're working on their uh, third-string left tackle since Russell Kuhn's not there. Pouncey had a bit of a rough of a game. You saw Forrest Lamp. Like, you have an offensive line that Indy was able to get a good amount of pressure to. And the Detroit Lions have a pass rush, which I think is a solid one that can cause kind of just about the same amount of issues. But the reason why I'm taking the Chargers is this, also as well. The Chargers were able to close their game. The Lions were not. Um, the Lions, carry on Johnson, only had 49 yards rushing. Uh, Matt Stafford had a very good game. They're in 22 yards, three TDs, no picks. But it was just the sense of where I felt like the Lions, they played too soft at the end, and the, and the Cardinals got way too hot. And they were able to make an 18-point comeback. Again, they, they, didn't, they didn't lose it, but to, to blow a game like that, knowing what talent you have, knowing how effective they were. Remember I said earlier, through their first 10 drives, they had 59 total yards. Um, Kyler Murray was like 9 of, 20, 9 of 29. He was sacked four times. Like The Lions did their job, and then they just played back a little bit. Also, Matt Patricia horribly mismanaged uh, that ending time out there near the end of the game. Do I think the Lions can be somewhat competitive? Sure. I think the Lions, you know, look, the Colts were able to run the ball very effectively. So Carrion Johnson may be able to have a better time running the ball, uh, especially with Derwin James not there. Melvin Gordon still won't be there. But after just looking at how, and basically besides Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler, nobody on the Chargers offense really did anything big for them receiving. Mike Williams, Travis Benjamin, Hunter Henry, nobody else really made that big of an impact through the air. Um, but I just, again, the Chargers... Better talented team. They're able to close games. They're they're going to make a play or two to be the difference. And I think they'll be able to pull this game out. 
It's going to be competitive, and I think the Lions will put up a good fight, but i got to trust the Chargers because they closed and the Lions didn't. So that's like the LA Chargers here, minus three, and the LA Chargers straight up. The next game, the Green Bay Packers over the Minnesota Vikings. To me, honestly, the best, the most impressive performance to me was the Minnesota Vikings uh, thumping the Atlanta Falcons. Um, that is, that was one of the most, imp- that was the most complete game I had seen against a team in the Falcons that were, I thought was an even game. And that was probably, besides Tennessee and Cleveland, that was the second worst pick I made the whole week. Um, congratulations to all the people that picked the Vikings. Uh, job well done. Um, Lower round of applause there. But I was just thoroughly impressed. Alvin Cook, 20 carries, 112 yards. He finally looked like that from his first game as a Viking. He looked that good and that effective. And I, job well done to him. I had to give credit to the Vikings offensive line. The Vikings caused four turnovers, which was massive, including two picks by Anthony Harris on Matt Ryan, which I thought was key. Because Kirk Cousins only went 8-10 or 9-10 for 98 yards. He really didn't have to do that much. But the Vikings defense smothered... Um, they smothered um, the Falcons from pillar to post, and I was thoroughly impressed. Um, you know, but Green Bay, it's kind of one of those things again, and Viking fans, shout out to Gio Nose and all other Vikings fans, don't get at me again, but kind of like the same thing about with Kirk Cousins trusting him again. I have that same problem with Aaron Rodgers. Like, I know Aaron Rodgers, he ended up throwing for about 220 yards and a TD and no interceptions. He clearly outplayed Trubisky just by those throws, massive throws to Scantling and Jimmy Graham and the mid- intermediate pass to Devontae Adams. I get that. But it just, again, like, that defense is going to be improved. They'll be able to get some pressure on Kirk Cousins. And there's just a part of me going, it's in Lambeau. I know this is a game that both teams are motivated for because last time these two teams played each other in Lambeau in Week 2, they tied. So maybe we could have the ex- same exact copy again uh, this time around. Um... But we will see. But I'm just going to take the Packers because I, I believe in that defense. I don't think it's going to be as good as it looked on Chica- uh, against the Bears on Thursday. Because I thought that was more just bad Mitchell Trubisky versus um, uh, good Packer defense. But I think again, Aaron Rodgers will be able to... Aaron Rodgers will not make the mistakes that, um, that Matt Ryan did. And I think that the Packers will be able to uh, make some more explosive plays and not as many mistakes, and get and get Cousins to make a mistake to uh, be the difference in the game. Also, I, I think the Packers, um, they'll be able to stretch the ball and make more explosive plays down the field than the Falcons were able to. Uh, it's going to be a great game, though. This one's a competitive game. I wouldn't be surprised if Minnesota won at all. Uh, I'm taking Green Bay as the favorite against the spread because it was, it was under three. If this was three or over, or three and a half or over, I would take the Vikings at a heartbeat. Uh, take the points, but I'm taking Green Bay. They're at home. I still don't have as much faith in Cousins. If Cousins win this week, then I really have to start looking at the Vikings definitely from a different perspective of just Kirk Cousins not being as good as the opposing quarterback and look at all things considered. It's going to be a great game. Two competitive teams, uh, a new defense, a new confident offensive line and offense. With Gary Kubiak is, an off- is a major offensive assistant. I'm going to take the home team. Uh, confidence in Rodgers going to be able to make more explosive plays and not as many and not as many mistakes and that'll give the Packers the victory over the Minnesota Vikings so that's why I like Green Bay here minus two and a half and Green Bay straight up the next game the Titans over the Colts um to me the what the Titans did was exactly why I cannot stand or this is what the Titans do okay this is what they do the Titans Whenever you see them, whenever you see them in games, whenever they're playing somebody that they they know they're not even supposed to be, they're not even supposed to be, they'll play their best football. Two great examples. They played the Patriots when nobody expected to beat them, and they played the Eagles last year when nobody expected to beat them. Had three fourth down conversions on that last drive to win, touchdown to Corey Davis, and they gave the Pats their most... Lobsided beatdown of the entire year last year, 34-10. to And that's what I thought when I saw against the Browns. Like, Mariota and that offense was incredibly efficient. Uh, at least pull up the numbers here. Derrick Henry was running fantastic through the uh, entire game. Let me see here. So, you had Mariota. You had Mariota go 
14 of 24, 248 yards, three TDs, no picks. Derrick Henry ran for 84 yards and a touchdown, and then he had a 75-yard touchdown where basically the Browns got entirely fooled, and Derrick Henry ran straight up the left sideline, 75 yards for the touchdown. Um, it was the most lopsided Titans win, I think, since they were the Oilers back in the 90s. And it was just a really impressive statement. And this was without Taylor Lewan, their best offensive lineman. Um, and, you know, so I was really impressed with the Titans. But again, they, were, they weren't expected to win that game. They were five and a half point underdogs entering the game. And they basically kind of showed that uh, they were real. You know, th- th- they were a solid team. And they weren't scared of the Browns' height. Also, shout out to A.J. Brown, who averaged 33.3 yards per reception for a three reception per 100-yard day game. And Delaney Walker looks solid coming back from injury, and I'm very happy he's back. Um, but the reason why I'm taking uh, the Titans is just because, again, I, I feel like they had a more, much more impressive win. I thought they were more complete. And they're also going to be motivated because um, Jacoby Brissett, the last time that um, they played him, uh, they beat him. But it's also one of those things where the Colts have had a history with Andrew Luck to uh, lose to them. In Andrew Luck's entire career, and this is a true stat, he never lost the Titans. And if I'm Mike Vrabel, I'm telling him, look, we haven't beat this team in so many years of Andrew Luck. Let's consider Jacoby Brissett Andrew Luck, and let's get this monkey off our back that we can't beat the Colts. It's a home game. The last time the Colts played Tennessee in Tennessee, it was the Blaine Gabbard-Andrew Luck game, and Blaine Gabbard basically threw the game away with two horrible interceptions late, or two horrible interceptions, one late in the game that sealed it. Um, but so I feel like the Titans are going to be motivated. They look more complete, and I trust Mariota with that offense fully clicking to uh, win this game. But the reason why I'm taking Indy against the spread is the same thing that I, I, I told you before, is that you know the Titans are favored in this game. They're supposed to win this. They're supposed to play well. They're supposed to get a nice, solid win over a Colt team, which, you know, is not going to be the division leader. I don't think they're going to be a playoff team, but they're going to be a hard out for any team that they play uh, because of their offensive line, because of their defense, and because of Marlon Mack, who uh, rushed for the most rushing yards since Edgerin James did in 2004, probably 160-plus yards. So, job well done to him. I'm going to take the Colts because I just don't can't trust the Titans when they're favored. They're going to play down to their competition, and I can see this game coming really close. Also, Adam Vinatieri, I think, wants to redeem himself for the pathetic game he had yesterday in the kicking department. It's going to be a great game. I think this game is crucial um, for both teams. I feel like with the Titans, um, they need it just to kind of stay afloat. Um, With Nick Foles going down in Jacksonville, it's basically a two-horse race, in my opinion, between them and the Texans. Maybe the Colts, if they win this game, will be right back in it. But I just like the Titans here. They're at home. They're going to use the motivation of losing this team consistently. And let's not treat Jacoby Brissett any different than Andrew Luck. We are going to try to beat him and do well. And that will be the difference in the game. So that's why I like Indianapolis here. Plus, that's why I like Indianapolis plus three. But the Titans straight up. And then the next game. When the the New England Patriots over the Miami Dolphins. Uh, this one. The New England Patriots. Without Anto- uh Without. I'll get to Antonio Brown in a second. Uh, the New England Patriots, uh, this past game, did not have their starting center, David Andrews. They did not have Demarius Thomas or Nikhil Harry, at wide receiver. They did not have Kyle Van Noy, who was uh, going to go to his wife to ten, uh, for labor. They didn't have Kyle Van Noy. They lost Marcus Cannon. They don't have Antonio Brown. And they still were able to win the game by 30 points. They have arguably I think they said 16 like 16 20 plus or 16 20 plus point victories or 16 or 26 plus point victories. The next closest team that has that wide a margin of victory is 12. Uh Tom Brady now goes to 6 and 0 all time against Ben Roethlisberger in Pittsburgh. He has averaged about 346 yards per game. And twenty in about nineteen TDs to zero interceptions in his time against Pittsburgh. It was an absolute destruction. It was an absolute painful thing to watch. It was it, it was amazing to watch because Tom Brady was efficient as ever. 24, 36, 346 yards, three TDs, no picks. He was thrown to everybody, and it basically looked like 
clockwork. It was smooth and consistent, um, unlike Pittsburgh. But now that they're getting Antonio Brown back, or they're getting Antonio Brown from the Raiders, and this is my opinion on the whole Antonio Brown situation quickly, I dis- I despised what he did to, to the Oakland Raiders um, by basically stringing them along and then being able to get to the Patriots. And it just, it, it, it makes me sick. I hope the Patriots, no, no offense, shout out to Andrew Warren and all Pats fans, no offense to you guys, but I hope you guys burn like a meteor and flame out like a dumpster. Or burn out and flame out horribly with Antonio Brown. Because, I know, and I know Antonio Brown's great and you don't need him. But to reward that type of behavior... To reward all the chaos and all. Because he never wanted to be a Raider. He never wanted to be one. That's why he put a, put his YouTube video out of him flapping like saying flying like an eagle. And I'm, I'm free. It felt like he just got out of prison. And you just don't reward a, a megalomaniac like that. And I hope all of you fail because of that. But in, in an objective way, Antonio Brown... The most productive receiver, the first receiver to have six 100 yard or six 100 reception seasons, uh, you know, a a surefire Hall of Famer, the best player Tom Brady will have ever thrown to. You basically can shut down the season or at least the AFC and give the Patriots a Super Bowl. That's how confident I am in, in Antonio Brown's ability if he can keep his head straight and his manners minded in in this team. Because if you if you can. If you can win a 30-point game against Pittsburgh without all that talent there, adding Antonio Brown, then getting to play Miami. They get to play Miami this week. They get to play then, I believe, the Jets. Yeah, Miami, the Jets, the Giants, the Bills, Washington, and Cleveland, and then some other bad team. They're going to get seven, eight wins in a row. They're going to get to 8 no before they play the Ravens in Week 9 where they maybe could lose for the first time. You know, so that's how confident I am in Antonio's ability to be effective. But I'm taking New England at minus 17 because Miami was the worst team in football. There's a mutiny in Miami already after one game. They gave up 59 points in like three and a half quarters. Lamar Jackson went 17-20, 301 yards, five TDs, no picks. He looked like Jalen Hurts out there. And the Dolphins just... Couldn't stop anything. They didn't care. I do want to give Ryan Fitzpatrick credit for being the first guy to throw a touchdown pass for eight different teams, NFL record. Woohoo. You know, job well done. In some ways, that's an impressive thing, but kind of a sad thing that you've been to all those different teams. Uh, and also, Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, you know, I think he could have some history on his, could have a historic moment where I believe he could be the first NFL quarterback ever to be in a division and win a game against Tom Brady in his division. Against with all three different teams, he beat the Bills. Uh, with the Bills, he beat Tom Brady week three, two thousand eleven. He beat the Jets with Tom Brady week sixteen, two thousand fifteen, and he could possibly beat Tom Brady with the Dolphins week two thousand nineteen. Do I think it's going to happen? Snowball's chance, you know, no way. Uh, but and also, I think for Tom Brady in the past, this is massive because since two thousand thirteen, the Patriots have gone down to Miami one, two, three, four, five, six. That's six times. They've gone since five or six straight times. And they've lost every single year in Miami. Every year. They lose in Miami. So they want that monkey off their back. And this team is way too talented defensively. Way too skilled not to do it against this Dolphin team. Brian Flores, good luck, sir. But you're going to get ran over by the Bill Belichick truck. And, you know, you basically could pack your bags and get that entire team to just, you know... I would basically let all those guys go and just get tryouts because that's where I think the Dolphins are going. Uh, but that's why I like New England at minus 17 and New England straight up. The next game, the Bills over the Giants. I'm taking Buffalo here because Buffalo... Buffalo's that weird team. Out of all the teams that won, they won in the ugliest way possible. Josh Allen had two picks. The game was 8 to nothing for like... 60-65% of the game. They were down 16 nothing going into the fourth quarter. And Josh Allen goes on a massive 17 nothing run in the final 18 minutes of the game. Capping it off with a John Brown touchdown on the sideline. That was, a great, that was a great route by Brown, by the way. And as soon as he missed, the one tackler missed, there was nobody uh, in front of him. So he just ran in the end zone. Um, 
but again, like I saw, I liked what uh, Devin Singletary did. I thought he was solid. The Bills defense pretty much clamped down on Sam Darnold. He only threw for 145 yards. They held Le'Veon to about 120 yards from scrimmage, which is pretty good because that was about 60 yards rushing, 60 yards receiving. Uh, Jamison Crowder, you know, you could say, well, you know, it was so effective that Jamison Crowder had the second most receptions for the Jets in an opener in their franchise history, and it didn't even matter. Um, but the reason why I'm taking Buffalo is that they were able to get the victory. I watched the Giants play. And, you know, Saquon Barkley, bless his heart, he had 11 carries from 120 yards. Um, and he did everything he could. Um, Evan Ingram was a, was the most effective offensive weapon they had. He had 11 receptions for 118 yards. But the Giants' defense was god-awful. Dak Prescott threw for 405 yards, 4 TDs. He was 24 of 32 um, he had a perfect passer rating, and I do I think Josh Allen will play like Dak Prescott? Absolutely not. I don't think he's gonna have a perfect passer rating, but I think Josh Allen can make enough throws, or they can run the ball effectively enough, and hold the Giants' offense and shut down Saquon to get another kind of close, gritty, fought-out victory. I feel like Josh Allen, like he's shown that he can make some big plays of his arm and his feet in key times, and I just don't see that with Eli. Eli just kind of you know did his motions. And that defense, like, you're going to have John Brown, Cole Beasley, um, Zay Jones, Frank Gore, Singletary, Tyler Croft. They're all going to be running up and down the field. And I feel like Allen's got a big enough arm that he can make those throws to those receivers to get them in position to score and make big plays. And the only, the only other reason why I'm taking Buffalo minus two is that, that I, it's a really small spread. If this was, like, five, six, seven, I'd take the Giants in a heartbeat. I feel like the Giants, they, they can kind of hold up. Also, a fun little fact here I found out. Buffalo um, Buffalo is trying to get their first win on over Eli Manning uh, in these Buffalo-New York Giant games. That's right. Buffalo is 0-2-1 or 0-2-1 against Eli Manning in his career. So I think for the first time, they'll be able to get a massive win uh, to get the 2-0 and, you know, kind of be an underrated uh, story of a 2-0 team that doesn't really deserve to be 2-0. But it's a credit to Sean McDermott's defense and the grit of that offense to get enough to win. But they're not going anywhere because they beat the Giants and Jets. So, congratulations, Buffalo. You beat the state of New York. <laughs> um, you know, hey, you only can play you can play, but, you know, once you play once you play a team outside of the state of New York or in New York, New Jersey area, it's going to be a different story for most of, the, most of the time. So that's why I like Buffalo here minus two and Buffalo straight up. The next game, the... Seahawks over the Steelers. This is one that I did not understand why the Steelers are three and a half point favorites after that game against the Pats. Uh, you know, like I said before, Ben's now 0-6 at home against Tom Brady career. Uh, Big Ben Roethlisberger's um, 20. He had the longest consecutive streak with touchdowns in the NFL with 26 games. That got ended. Um, he, this was also the second time he lost in his entire career by 30 or more points. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster ended up with six receptions, 78 yards. James Conner ran 10 times for 28 yards. Um, the defense only got five hits on Tom Brady in one sack. Um, they couldn't really do anything effective. The entire secondary was getting burned by Edelman, uh, by Gordon, by uh, Jacoby Myers. Made a big contested catch, which I thought was huge. They didn't really need, even need Matt Lacoste or any of their tight ends. Um... And it was just just a clinic. Um, I kind of criticized. They were down by like seventeen nothing, or it was like twenty to three, and it was like twenty nothing. And I'm thinking, well, and it was like about ten minutes left in the third quarter. And I'm like, yeah, you might want to go for it at this point because you got to try something. But they took the field goal because they were they basically chickened out or tapped out at that point. And I, I didn't think that was gonna be the last point of the game where they didn't score anything. Um, but Juju now is a toe injury. They just traded away Josh Dobbs to the Jags. For a fifth round pick. And Big Ben just looked uninterested and uninspired. They just, he looked not happy. Um, and I just, I can't take Pittsburgh. I was going to before the season when I saw this game. Uh, because I thought Pittsburgh was going to be better. Um, but the reason why I'm taking Seattle is just where I just feel like, again, if you got a banged up Juju, if he can play or not, if they double team him, let Big Ben try to throw to James Washington, Dante Moncrief. Vance McDonald, Ryan Switzer. Let him try to throw to all those weapons. And the Seahawks, um, who, who I, I will say this, their run defense was solid, I thought, 
um, this week. Uh, let, me, let me pull this up here. Their pass offense, their passing defense was awful. They gave in, they, they let Andy Dalton throw for career high 411 yards. So I don't think Big Ben will look as bad passing as he did before. Um, but let me see here. How much did they hold uh, Carson to? Or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mixon to? They held. Um, let me see here. They held. Um, the uh, they held the Bengals to thirty four rushing yards. They held the Bengals. They gave up four hundred eighteen passing yards. Held the uh, held the Bengals to thirty four rushing yards. So if if you double team Juju, if you shut down their run, let Ben try to throw to those other receivers. It's not going to happen. Russell Wilson effective as ever. Fourteen of twenty, one hundred seven about one hundred ninety yards, two TDs, no picks. I think he'll play another solid game like that. And I just I just have faith in Seattle. That they'll be able to kind of grind it out against Pittsburgh in a tough game. Wilson will make, you know, two or three bigger plays that Ben can't match, and that'll be the difference in the game. It's going to be a great game. I think Pittsburgh will be motivated to try to show that they're not this bad. Um, I, don't, I don't think they are, but I think Seattle. But coming off the two games, I'll take the win over the bad team, over the blowout by a great team any day of the week, and that's the reason why I'm taking Seattle. Plus three and a half in Seattle straight up. The next game, uh, the Cowboys over Washington. Um, this one to me was just in the fact of where I saw Washington through that first half, or through the first, yeah, through the first half. That was a great half. Case Keenum threw for about 250 yards, two TDs, no picks. Vernon Davis with a phenomenal 48 yard touchdown, basically caught it over the defender and then ran the rest of the way through. Um, but they they could throw the ball effectively, but they couldn't run the ball at all. Darius Geis ended up with 10 carries for 18 yards, and then now he's hurt again, so he's going to be out for an extended period of time. And the weirdest thing about this whole thing was Adrian Peterson was deactivated. He was a healthy scratch. For what reason? Like, And that, that makes me question, why did the Redskins sign Adrian Peterson to a two-year extension if they weren't even going to play him? But now they are going to play him because now Geis is hurt again. And what a horrible bust of a second-round pick he's been for them. Just because of his injuries. Um, but I'm taking Dallas here. Like, you know, Dak Prescott, you already talked about. Like, he, he is one of two quarterbacks to have a perfect passer rating in Dallas. I don't even think Tony Romo or Troy Aikman never hit a perfect passer rating, but he did. Um, Ezekiel Elliott, they were they had not won a game when Ezekiel Elliott ran for under 75 yards. He did. Um, but I don't think that mattered because how bad the Dallas uh, Giants secondary was. Um... Dallas definitely was bend, but don't break. They almost had 500 yards of offense, but they only held them to 17 points. And I kind of feel like the same thing with Washington, where I feel like Washington can make some plays. You have Paul Richardson. You have Vernon Davis. You have uh, McLaurin. Uh, he was their rookie who made that big 70-yard touchdown. And they have Trey Quinn. And it's another type of division game. And I think Washington kind of showed they're a little bit better as a team, and they'll put up more of a fight. Hopefully Jonathan Allen's okay, even though I don't think he's going to play because he, he has an MCL sprain. Um, but I'm going to take Dallas here. More effective running, solid, more effective defense. Dak will outplay Keenum. Dak will make some bigger throws. The Cowboys have more talent. And Dallas has seemed to have Washington's number for the most part in the Dak Prescott era. I believe he is 5-1 um, and one against Washington all time. And that, that, that should be going to 6-1 and one now after this game on uh, Sunday afternoon. So that's why I like Dallas here, minus 4, and Dallas straight up. The next game, the Ravens over Arizona. This one, to me, is just very much in the sense of uh, Lamar Jackson can play quarterback. Lamar Jackson, I don't know. I don't think he will be that efficient and that explosive. I don't think he is that effective. He's not Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers or a quarterback that can make an offense like that. But he definitely showed you that he can throw an effective spiral and make deep throws, short throws, middle throws, and be able to make you know the appropriate decisions. And he did not nearly run his off. And I think he ran like two or three times for like six yards. But I will take that because I'd much rather him run if he has to instead of run, you know, because he had like run if he has to, you know, instead of him having to do it. That's what I was trying to say. Um, but I thought it was really impressive. It was a complete game. We scored the most points in franchise history through 
a half. It's 42. Um, and I, I, I talked to you about the Cardinals. It was one of those things where, like, the Lions... The Lion, the Cardinals basically did what the Ravens couldn't do in the playoff game. The chart, like, they turned garbage time back into a game. We tried to do that last year against the Chargers. We ended up about seven points, or uh, about seven points short. Um, but that offense, though, was pretty bad for the most part if you take out that fourth quarter. Um, I just think, again, like, we won't give up a lead like that. We will clamp down on the Cardinal offense. Um, Jimmy Smith has an MCL sprain, or, you know, so hopefully he'll be okay. I don't think he'll play for a couple weeks, but I don't think that will matter. There's no Patrick Peterson, and Kyler Murray will get harassed by the, uh, Raven defensive line. The Raven offensive line should be able to hold up against the Cardinal pass rush. The only guy we have to really worry about is Chandler Jones. Um, but the reason why I took the Cardinals plus 13, they just made an 18-point comeback. They can make a 13-point comeback, especially against the Ravens, if we do the same thing. So that's why I like uh, Baltimore here uh, straight up, but Arizona plus 13. Uh, Houston over the Jaguars. I'm taking Houston here just because um, the Jags... They only averaged about 16 points per game at home um, last year. They gave up 40 to Chiefs. I know it's Patrick Mahomes, and I know he does that often. Like, they put up 25-plus points in, like, you know, 20, you know, like, in almost every game he's played, they put up at least 25-plus points. Um, but the reason, uh, you know, and I, I know, but the reason why I'm taking Jacksonville against the spread here is because I have Gardner Minshew, who started 10-10. He did a good job against the Chiefs' defense. It was too much, and the Chiefs kept the Chiefs' offense kept, you know, getting to the Jags' defense. And by the way, uh, guys like Calais, guys like Jalen, guys like AJ, if I'm the Jags, especially with how this team is going to go, with Nick Foles not being there for the next seven weeks or so, maybe a little bit longer, I would consider at the end of this year fire, or getting rid of Calais, possibly try trying to trade Boye and not signing Jalen Ramsey to a long-term deal because you're not getting anywhere with this team. You know, unless Gardner Minshew can be the star, I don't think he, you know, I don't think he can. But I just don't have, like, there's no point in keeping him because Doug Marone's going to get fired. And these guys are old or just too expensive or, you know, not worth maybe the headache or the controversy that they may bring or the money they're making at this point where the Jags are trying to be at. I think Houston as well. I think Houston, you know, they'll be able to protect uh, Deshaun Watson better. I think, you know, in the games that he played last year, he was able to win both of them pretty effectively. Um, I don't think they're going to have as many turnovers, which, which would be something interesting to see. Because I remember Blake Bortles, the one game in Jacksonville, they lost 20-6. to He had like two or three turnovers, which basically was the difference in the game. Um, I think Houston, though, they have the much better defense. I think they're more, mo you know, they're more solid basically in most assets. I'll take uh, Carlos Hyde and Duke Johnson. Leonard Fournette kind of had an okay game, but he also had the fumble. First time since uh, first time he fumbled since LSU played Arkansas, I believe, back in 2016, that he fumbled the football uh, in his career. Um, but I think Houston, they're just a the more effective team. The offensive line is going to be better. And I just feel like if if Patrick Mahomes can put up and shred uh, the uh, Houston or the Jacksonville secondary with his weapons. Deshaun Watson can have a similar, maybe a little bit lower standard performance, the same with his offense with the Texans. So that's why I like uh, Jacksonville here plus eight and a half, but Houston straight up. I'm doing Jacksonville plus eight and a half um, for the sense of very much to me, it's very Washington Philly esque. Um, I think Philadelphia is the far superior team, but it's a division game with a lot of close, you know, features, and they don't know Gardner Minshew, and I think Gardner Minshew can be a little bit of a nasty gnat uh, for them to keep within a touchdown score. So that's why I like uh, Houston here uh, straight up, but Jacksonville plus 8.5. The Chiefs over the Raiders, um, this was easy. Um, I know Tyreek Hill uh, is dealing with a shoulder injury. He actually has his, apparently his clavicle is shoved into his uh, sternum. Um, and I think that is, that is a very painful injury. He is not going to require surgery, but he's going to be out for the next several weeks. But they don't need him. Um, they put up, I think, over 30 points the last time um, when they were in Oakland. And I just look at Oakland where they're just not going to be able to stop him. Like, Oakland's defense really didn't improve. They just lost Antonio Brown. What offense do they have? Tyrell Williams. Uh, they, brought in, they brought in Keelan Doss, 
who was on their who was on their squad, who they let go of, the Jacksonville picked up. They brought him back. They have Tyrell Williams. You have Josh Jacobs. The offensive line. You you re, you re-sign Hudson to a three-year deal. You have Gabe Jackson. You have Darren Waller, a tight end. You know, can Derek Carr put up points and yards? Sure. Gardner Minshew just did. So Gardner Minshew can, you know, carve up the Chief defense. Derek Carr can. But do I think the Chiefs' offense, you know, will get pushed over, pushed around by the Raiders? Absolutely not. That that defense is going to crumble, and Patrick Mahomes will have, have a field day, especially with Sammy Watkins feeling the way he's doing. He had a six reception, 198 yard, three TD game, the best game he has had since one of his games in Buffalo, I believe. And to me, that is definitely the difference um, for the Chiefs in this game. And again, I, I just think the Chiefs, they'll get a turnover, they'll get one or two stops and get to a 10-point margin and be able to hold on to it. So that's why Kansas City here minus 9 and Kansas City straight up. The next game, the Bears over the Broncos. This was really tough. Um, I'm going with the Bears here just because I think the Bears defense, it'll show up against Joe Flacco. And I think I tr- I'm i going to trust Matt Nagy enough to, uh, to reshape the offense or be able to put up enough points and I'll say the Bears score 20 20 or 24 points and that Bear defense should be enough to clamp down the Denver uh Denver offense um I, you know I I really wanted to take Denver because I, I just saw how ineffective Trubisky was and I looked at the Denver defense and I see similar aspects to it um I have uh Kareem Jackson Bradley Chubb, Von Miller, Shelby Harris, um, Chris Harris Jr., uh, Todd Parks, Justin Simmons, who I, who I think is a solid uh, DB. You have uh, Brandon Gostis, uh, Derek uh, Derek Wolf. You have a very solid Denver defense and an offense with guys like Tim Patrick, Cortland Sutton, uh, Emmanuel Sanders, Philip Lindsay. Uh, Jeff Hireman, like you have a you have a decent Denver offense that I think can work effectively with Joe Flacco's strengths to win, but I just think the Bears defense will come at the Broncos, and I think the Bears offense will fit right itself enough this week to be effective enough to win this game. But I'd be surprised if Denver won not at all. With Trubisky having three points after giving up with the Packers in two of their first three quarters, like less than 80 yards of offense, Trubisky could definitely blow this game for them. He did against the Green Bay on Thursday when he threw that pick to uh, Adrian Amos. But I'm going to trust Nagy enough here, hopefully, to fix the offense enough to get about 20 to 24 points, and they're and the Denver Broncos just not being able to do anything defensively. Uh, so that's why I like uh, Chicago against the spread and a pick them, and Chicago straight up. The next game, the Rams over the Saints. Oh, man. This one, it's just the Rams are home. I looked at what the Rams did on Sunday. I thought Jared Goff had a mediocre game. He was average. Um, it was really more so the Rams causing turnovers. They caused three turnovers by the Panthers, two fumbles, and I believe an interception. Um, there was a difference in the game. Todd Gurley had an, had an average game. He had 14 carries for 97 yards. And for all fantasy owners out there, I feel bad for you because Malcolm Brown vultured two touchdowns. He only had 30 yards, but he had two TDs, which is where the money comes in for fantasy. Um... But I look at the uh, Rams here, it's just because they're home. If this game was in New Orleans, I would have taken the Saints easily. They would be motivated. They would be, you know, ticked off. And I know they're still going to be motivated. But they would have that home crown, that motivation to go against the Rams and kick their, you know, kick the crap out of them just for getting redemption for what happened. But this game is in L.A. And, you know, I'm going to trust the Rams here. You know, they, they, they had the extra day of rest. Uh, they have the better running game. The offensive line did okay. The Jared Goff had, you know, had his moments. They have the better kicker, and I just feel like again the Rams are in a better place. The Rams know what they can do. They just played a, you know, a solid Carolina team. Let's see how New Orleans does against Houston. We'll see. And I'm taking the Rams here. It's going to be a competitive game. I'm going to trust that home field. I'm going to trust the home field of the Rams. I know they don't have a crowd home field advantage, but the last time the Saints came out to LA, they lost 26 to 20. And I could see a similar type of thing happening there in the same way. It's going to be a great game. Uh, but very much like uh, Indy, Tennessee, close, too close of a game, three-point spread. I'm going to hedge my bet here. <laughs> I'll get a win out of this somehow. 
Um, but I'm going to take the the Rams here. Home home field advantage. I trust Jared Goff a little bit more, and they and I just think the Saints they're not going to be able. Uh, gonna, there's going to be one key mistake or one key difference that costs the Saints this game. That's why I like the Rams here uh, straight up, but the Saints plus three. Next game, the Eagles over the Falcons. <sighs> I'm taking the Eagles here. Um, they looked awful through the first half. They it was twenty to six. They gave up a forty eight yard touchdown to Vernon Davis, and they gave up another seventy yard touchdown to their rookie receiver. Um, and it was just bad. Carson Wentz looked ineffective. They really couldn't run the ball. They had a big turnover on downs. But then Carson Wentz and that offense and that entire team decided to wake up and play the best second half at any team this week that I had seen. Um, fun fun fact here: Carson Wentz had only thrown two uh, two deep passes of twenty plus yards, or it was like two deep twenty plus yard TDs all year last year. He had two this game to Deshaun Jackson, who had eight receptions or under fifty six yards and two TDs. Welcome back to Philly, Deshaun. Job well done. Happy to have, happy to see you back in the green and white for the Eagles. Um, I thought the Eagles defense they got a lot of pressure on Case Keenum through the second half. I thought um, for Philadelphia it was a sense to me where um, they just clearly did, like dominated that second half. I'm concerned about that secondary, and I think of an Atlanta offense that has a lot of potential. Key word, um, they could definitely light them up, but I, I can't take Atlanta because. Fun fact for everybody, Matt Ryan's a top, like, six-paid quarterback. They had a top six or seven-paid running back in Devontae Freeman. They just gave Grady Jarrett a four-year, $68 million extension. They have Desmond Trufant on a five-year, $70 million extension. Vic Beasley's playing on his fifth-year option. Um, they have uh, Deion Jones, who signed one of the top five line, middle linebacker contracts. They just gave Julio Jones a three-year, $66 million extension with $64 million guaranteed. Um... This is a very expensive team that they have on the field that looked like absolute garbage uh, in all facets of the game. And if Dan Quinn, if you keep performing like that, you're going to get fired at the end of this year, my friend, because you cannot have that highly talented of a team, expensive of a team, and look like absolute garbage, doo-doo, any you know word, if you want to say, for the excrement for what they produced out there on the field last week. Um... You know, again, it's a home opener. Maybe Atlanta will be motivated to kick, you know, to kick the rear ends of the Jet, you know, or to kick the rear ends of the Eagles after getting embarrassed by Minnesota. I doubt it. Um, and I just think again, Philadelphia, they'll 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 flex their mind around and do a good job. Sounds like Philadelphia against the spread and Philadelphia straight up. And finally, the Browns over the Jets. Uh oh boy. Uh this one was just strictly off a of talent. This one, I'm like, okay, what team's more talented? Because both teams had probably the two, besides the Lions, if you want to put them third, they had the two most embarrassing losses of the weekend. You had the Browns, who are now lost 15 straight opening days, 0-14-1. They had their most penalties ever with 10 for 180. Most penalties since 2016 with the Raiders. Um, they Baker Mayfield threw three interceptions, just like he threw three interceptions in his last game. Uh, they had their left tackle ejected for kicking one of the players. Odell Beckham was wearing a $350,000 watch. And just a whole bunch of craziness was going on. But I just look at the Browns, and, and that, that was bad. But then you look at the Jets, who blew a 16-point lead in the fourth quarter to a Bills team that didn't, that didn't even deserve to win that game. But the reason why I'm taking the Browns is they just have more talent. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Jets won this game because the Cleveland Browns just screw up. The one thing you can say is this. Whoever loses this game, we know that they will suck. Because you, you can't lose the games they did their first week and then lose to each other the second week and really think that you're a good team. So that's why I like Cleveland there minus two and a half and Cleveland straight up. But those are my picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Um, to, and please tell me if you have any opinions or any questions. And please check out the NFL YouTube prognosticators page. I will put uh, a, lot of the, a lot of their uh, channels in the description. They're great people that make predictions like I do, and I enjoy watching their videos, and I hope you do as well if you want different opinions. Uh, but that's it. So until next week for week three, this is Matt, the NFL Fanatic, signing off. Until next time, so long.